الحمد لله بس اتعملت كويس برضه انا ربنا يكرم ان شاء الله يا سيدي الحمد لله المهم انتم كويسين هو لازم يبقى في باك اب باك اب ده يعني برضه بنتعلم منها باك اب يعني اثنين بيصوروا بحيث لو حاجه اتبظت يبقى الثانيه جاهزه جود مورنينج ايفري بادي يعني صباح الخير Uh, it's my pleasure to start our uh, session uh, on interventional uh, pulmonology uh, and uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tariq Safat, uh, Chairman of the Egyptian uh, Scientific Society of Bronchology and uh, Prince Al Amrad Al Sadriya, but in Arabic. Nassan. Hey. And uh, uh, his talk will be about uh, interventional pulmonology, uh, past, present, and future. Uh, Professor Tare is one of our pioneers in interventional uh, pulmonology from a very long time until now. And uh, yani we always enjoy his talks. Father Dr. Tare. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm actually passing my the flag to uh, other professors like Ahmed Warra, Yasser Mustafa, etc. So they are the uh, really the real interventionists now. So let's let me uh, uh, go through quickly on the intervention bronchoscopy in Egypt. In Egypt, I'm, I'm going to discuss only what's going on in Egypt as a past, present, and what's our future expectation. So. Uh, 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 Professor Hassan Hosni is uh, actually the godfather of bronchoscopy in Egypt and in the region. He was the first to introduce uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy in uh, 1972. And uh, he is actually the mentor of uh, many, many of the professors nowadays. In 01, we, uh, we founded the Egyptian Scientific Society of Bronchology and in 07, We, we found it as the foundation of the Egyptian Journal of uh, Bronchology. And that was one of the first uh, uh, articles in the, uh, in the journal on the intervention bronchoscopy in Shams University hospital experience. Actually, I'm going to go through very quickly for the time I'm uh, allowed for 15 minutes laser cryoelectroargon stenting in different institutes in Egypt. Uh, this was a, a, an intervention bronchoscopy in the initial management of benign. This was a paper of benign and malignant tracheal stenosis, and it showed the results, especially after mechanical ventilation with the subglottic stenosis, and how we proceeded with the uh, Uh, electrocuterization or laser and followed by stenting, etc. Uh, this was followed as well by the cryo extraction post electrocutery that was in Mansoura University uh, by Professor Mohammed Khairi and uh, a lot of doctors in the group. And in Tanta University, Ain Shams, Cairo University, Munufia, all of these institutes and uh, universities had this practice in electro and cryotherapy in inoperable malignant lesions. Uh, in Ain Shams, we had an evaluation of bronchoscopic placement of tracheobronchial silicon stents. Actually, we had, we had a vast experience with the group, the interventional pulmonary group, Ahmed Orra, Ashraf Matkour, and uh, Nihad Osman, and all the group, uh, Yasser uh, Mustafa and Khaled Wagi, in stenting of pre cases with bronchogenic carcinoma and uh, especially with the Jumon stent. Uh, Monofe as well and Cairo University in Shams, all of them had this cryotherapy as well practice for endobronchial lung cancer. Uh, 
foreign body, a lot, a lot of papers has been published in the literature, whether in the Oncology Journal or the Egyptian Journal of Chest Disease and Tuberculosis and international papers. Uh, in Ain Shams, I'm not going to talk about Ain Shams. We had a vast experience, especially with the interventional pulmonologists working in this field, especially Professor Ahmed Orra in extracting uh, foreign bodies. Uh, and actually, we, 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 were, we were a kind of referral for a lot of uh, departments, ENT, the EN, even the EN, ENT department used to send for us the uh, young children with foreign body aspiration. Uh, another uh, paper was very interesting, the Isanol uh, chemotherapy intertumoral uh, chemotherapy in palliation in operable lung cancer, and that was a paper published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, from our department and by injection of intramembra through a very fine uh, transbronchial uh, needle. And it shows before and after the, uh, the orifice which, and the segment which was opened after the intratumoral injection of Isanol. The same thing, Wansura had the same experience as well, by, led by Professor Muhammad Khairi and the group uh, by injection of Isanol as well. And then we went into the EBIS. Actually, we had the EBIS in 2001, the EBIS, the radial one. And uh, we're developing now in the future, we'll have the, uh, the uh, real time. And a lot of papers, I'm going to go through them in different institutes, had this vast experience with the EBIS uh, as the, in diagnosis of mediastinal lesions in uh, different uh, universities, actually. In Asyut, for instance, in Asyut University, there was a very interesting uh, paper by Professor uh, Sharif Muhammad, I believe, and he was uh, in Japan, and he did this epidermal growth factor receptor mutation by endobronchial ultrasound-guided transbronchial T TBNA. And then we went through the uh, the collaborative collaborative uh, uh, collaboration with the military academy uh, and Ain Shams University with the uh, real time convex probe uh, EBUS, Tanta as well, and Cairo University. Uh, all we had a vast uh, practice with the EBUS, which is a kind of revolution, and it's taking over the surgical media cyanoscopy. In uh, 2000, we, we got the AF, the autofluorescence, and I believe uh, Cairo as well, University uh, brought uh, both this equipment and Asyut as well. And it helped in early detection of lung cancer. It was quite expensive as, uh, as a device. And uh, there was a very nice paper as well, combining the EBUS with uh, the autofluorescence, so we can detect early detection and we can as well know the depths of the tumor lesion. This was in the old days, the old good days, with a bunch of uh, doctors, led by Yasser Mustafa, Ahmad Urra, Ashraf Matkur, and myself. What's the future expectation? The future expectation, that was what talking about uh, my dear colleague and uh, my chief, uh, Yasser Mustafa. And he's uh, moving forward with the JICA for developing of the ICU, the RICO, in our department with all the bunch of uh, new devices, including the ECMO as well. We will have the lung point uh, system. It's the navigation system. And uh, this, is, this will uh, help in uh, getting biopsies from peripheral nodules. Uh, actually, in Azhar, they had a collaboration with the military uh, academy, and this they, they used this lung point navigation, and it's a, a kind of uh, interest, uh, very interesting for the future. Ultrasound is very important, and uh, we'll have this, uh, actually, we got this, uh, the uh, real-time EBUS with a clinical application as, as it can visualize, visualize mediastinal peribronchial lymph nodes, the depths of tumor invasion, positional relationship, localizing diagnosis and staging of lung cancer. Uh, 
one of the papers from Tanta by uh, Mohammed Hantir and the group, uh, and they said that it's uh, and it's well recognized and appreciated that EUS uh, esophageal ultrasonography can be of more help in evaluating and biopsying the subcarinal region of its because of its better tolerability, higher diagnostic yield, and lower complication rate. We had as well uh, a very interesting uh, uh, in investigation and uh, procedures with cryobiopsy with Professor Khaled Wagi. And it takes, uh, actually, the cryobiopsy helps a lot to get a, lot, a, a, a good size uh, tissue biopsy. And it has a lot of advantage, even if, we, if you can proceed with cryobiopsy, it can rule out, we can, we can neglect a surgical lung biopsy. It's easier, and but we have to appreciate as well some complications like bleeding. So whenever you do the cryobiopsy, please check your uh, workup, including the CBC platelets, etc., prostrombin time, bleeding, coagulation, and you have to have uh, a full articulation just in case of bleeding. Uh, this was in Tanta and Cairo University as well with the diagnostic yield of cryobiopsy. So a lot of uh, institutes have performed the cryobiopsy and in Alexa Alexandria as well. It can help as well in uh, for smear negative palmar tuberculosis in better diagnostics. And uh, this was as well in Tanta. We have to have a multidisciplinary approach with the rose which is a rapid on-site evaluation technique. And I think it can help a lot for those working in interventional pulmonology. So you can detect, you can detect on-site what's happening and what's the kind of biopsy, is it benign or malignant? Uh, so uh, the rapid on-site evaluation of the ROSE technique is important to have in our endoscopy suite. Uh, now, with the inter interventional uh, interventionist uh, Professor Ahmed Orra, with the uh, we're looking forward to have this kind of uh, of uh, valves and uh, for the treatment of COPD patients and emphysema. However, as we all know, that it's very very expensive. The uh, the cause the the the, uh, the valves are damn expensive. So what we're doing now is the low cost and the bronchial lung volume reduction with autologous blood, and this was a really promising method with positive results from patients with severe emphysema. And uh, it was published in Mansoura, the low-cost biological lung volume reduction for advanced emphysema. And in Cairo University, with Professor Mohammed Abd Hakim Al Nadi, he performed lung volume reduction with silver nitrate 0.5% with histoacryl, which is as well much cheaper than the coils and much cheaper than the valves, and it gave a, a very good results. So. Uh, uh, the missing points, that's my two last two slides, the missing points we have to face is we have to have an Egyptian consensus concerning anesthesia. And we have to have a, one language. Uh, we need to have a good practice, the good team of interventional with a good anesthetist. And uh, so it's, it sh we should have a kind of guideline uh, for the anesthesia procedure during our work in interventional. Uh, another point is to have a, an informed consent. Sometimes we don't go with a consent with our patients, so we have to give him an instruction or to give him uh, to take his approval and a consent before proceeding with intervention uh, procedures. Uh, actually, through our uh, history from the start of the foundation of this uh, society of the bronchology, uh, we had a lot of uh, workshops and training is very important. Actually, uh, workshops, we had uh, workshops on hand-on experience live uh, on wet labs in Cairo University, Alexandria, in Asyut as well. And uh, the last one was directed by Professor Ahmed Orra a couple of weeks before with Ashraf Matkur and uh, Mohammed Hantir. Uh, 
and on the 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 WAJIP, the working group international pulmonology uh, intervention pulmonology pulmonology headed by professor Ahmed Orra and it's uh, endorsed by the Egyptian scientific society of pulmonology that's one of the the very active chapters in our society another chapter which is extremely important in our society is the uh, the pediatric pulmonology and it's headed by professor Nader Fasih and he's doing a lot a lot of effort in workshops in Alexandria and in training of interventional pulmonology for the pediatrician. Uh, so uh, as uh, Professor Yassim Mustafa mentioned, we're, uh, we're going to have this simulator and simulation which can help a lot in our training and practice in the future. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tare. Shukran uh, al-hudur uh, hadaratku jami'an wa insha'Allah al-mu'tamar yibqa nagih hazal aam wa al-hayyaa barahab bqudum ustazi al-fadil ustazi Dr. Mukhtar Matkur hadaratak munawarna fan ala anba hadaratak yusharifni hayaan ya adam zamili rafiq al-kifah Dr. Ahmad Qura'a the utility of interventional pulmonology in liberating patients with malignancy associated central airway obstruction from mechanical ventilation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wa rahab bil kul al-hudur al-kareem. Wa al-hayya al-muhadra ba'd al-usas doktor tala safa ha tiba sa'aba jidda di'ad. Ha'awla ktisib al-hudu illu huwa bi-kallim bi fi al-muhadratu. هتكلم النهاردة عن the utility of interventional pulmonology in liberating patients with malignant associated central airway obstruction from mechanical ventilator. As an introduction, the primary or metastatic tumors involving central airways produce airflow disruptions. If left untreated, it can increase the work of breathing and affecting the ventilation. يعني الجهاز تغيير. malignant central airway obstruction is primarily due to lung cancer followed by ممكن esophageal cancer ممكن بعد كده thyroid cancer وممكن lymphoma. other tumors can also metastasize resulting in central airway obstruction. تقريبا 20 ل 30 في المية وده الرقم ده حفظناه بتهيألي 20 ل 30 في المية of all primary lung cancer will at some point develop airway involvement ويا تعمل central airway obstruction عدد مش قليل خالص يعني تلت الحالات تقريبا يعني في زي ما كلنا عارفين three general types of central airway obstruction have been described ال end luminal type زي ما هو باين هنا اللي هو tumor within the airways ال extra luminal type اللي هو from compression from without او compressive effects of tumor growth we a mixed type. The presence and severity of symptoms associated with central airway obstruction is to some extent related to tumor size, the shape, the location of the tumor. However, individual, individual symptoms are influenced additionally by the presence of other diseases, comorbid disease, like cardiopulmonary disease, neurological disease, musculoskeletal disease, metabolic and nutritional diseases. As well as overall performance status to our patient, Bardo, had the discontinuous intervention, well, no, away in the room that I'm seeing. Patients with severe isolated central airway obstruction or combined with additional disease states can develop progressive respiratory insufficiency, necessitating admission to ICU and to be mechanically ventilated. Eventual mechanical ventilation vibration may be unattainable without treatment of the central air obstruction, leading to prolonged ICU stays and translating into a high course of care. We did a كانت إيرا جديدة عندنا بعد دخول الانترفيشال بالمونولوجي لدرجة إنه كان فيه يعني زمايلي كانوا بيسربوا جدا يعني how to to win a patient يعني أول ما يدخل نعمله انترفيشال بالمونولوجي برونكوسكوبي يطلع 
extubated immediately and this was marvelous الحقيقه interventional pulmonary medicine that emerged في 1980 في الثمانينات يعني has been available now uh, new airway procedure that can treat central airway obstruction The intervention pulmonology utilizes advanced technologies such as ablative therapy, which is the muscle and laser, with argon plasma coagulation, with the electrocautery itself, with cryotherapy and airway uh, stenting. The ablative therapy, which is used in the management of mechanically ventilated patients, mainly with laser, then we use the electrocautery. We don't use the argon plasma for this, as in the shallow penetration. We don't use also the cryotherapy because as in slow, slow action. The first report that I can suggesting the potential use of laser photoresection for the treatment of malignant central airway obstruction requiring mechanical ventilation can be Alpha to Omega Seven. With them, I mean, where six patients with subtotal airway obstruction of the trachea or main stem bronchi were successfully liberated from mechanical ventilation by using NDAG laser and survived uh, to have additional therapies. Bad again. في 1993 the utility of ablative intervention pulmonology procedures for the treatment of respiratory failure due to malignant central airway obstruction was specifically examined في 17 عيان with lung cancer. The overall success of laser in liberating from mechanical ventilation كان حوالي 53% من patients دول. Those with endoluminal شوف علشان مش اللابتوب بتاعي فالدنيا اتلخبطت شويه. Those with endoluminal disease, 12 patients were more likely to benefit from laser compared uh, with patients with submucosal invasion and extraluminal compression. ودي الصوره بتبين ال ال patients after laser therapy. الحاجه الثانيه اللي بتستخدم الاير ستنتنج. A successful operation from mechanical ventilation using metallic stent was first described in patient with thymic carcinoma. When you have a CT vein here, that has a thymic carcinoma with an endobronchial invasion. Of course, the use of metallic stent will be malleable more with the compression of the airways. وبعدين ما كمان ممكن استخدم الكوتد ستنت والكومبليكيشنز المايجريشن بتاعها بيبقى اقل من السيليكون ستنت الحقيقه ان البيشنت دايت تو مانثز افتر ذا بروسيدور ما تقلقوش سينس ذا ريبورت اوف ذا يوز اوف ذا سيمز اللي احنا بنسميه السيلف اكسباندبل ميتاليك ستنت تو فاسيليتيت اكستوبيشن ان بيشنت ويز ميلاجن سنترال ايوي اوبستراكشن Has been examined in several limited studies and case reports. The largest investigated the utility of SEMS, which is self-expandable metallic stent, deployed via flexible bronchoscopy for 21 patients with malignant associated central airway obstruction requiring mechanical ventilation. Can the two, the whom the 21 patients, can five patients with benign disease were included in the study for a total of 26 patients. The overall success can 53.8% شرح بتاع الليزر تقريبا. The primary factor associated with failure can severe pneumonia after after stent implementation. In a similar study of 50 patients. كان 39 with lung cancer و11 عيان with metastatic cancer airway stenting facilitating vibration from mechanical ventilation في 7 of 8 patients requiring mechanical ventilation يعني 87.5% reported complications بعد الستنت كان يشمل الجرانديلوما infection المايجريشن هيموبسيس و disease recurrence في ريتروسبكتيف ستادي تشارت ريفيو بقى في الايرواي ستنتنج فاسيليتيد لايبريشن بكام بقى 100 اوف بيشنتس ريسيفينج ميكانيكال فينتريشن 5 ويز اكسترا ليومنال كومبريشن اند 1 ويز اندو ليومنال ديزيز سيميلر ريزلتس ور ريبورتد ان 4 بيشنتس ويز سنترال ايرواي اوبستراكشن فروم اوسوفاجيال كانسر اول بيشنتس ويز لايبريتد ويزين ا 1 داي اوف ميكانيكال فينت اوف سنت ريبليسمنت اند ويز ايفينشوالي ديشارجد فروم دي هوستال 
ان ريسنت ريبورت 3 من 7 ايامين اوف ويز مالجنال سنترال ويب ابستراكشن وير لايبريتد فروم ميكانيكال فنتريشن افتر اير ستنتنج 2 من 4 هو ريكواير كونتينوس فنتريتور فنتريتور سبورت ديفلوبت سوبر فينا كابل سندروم اللي تو لايبريتد بيشنس ليف between three to six months, whereas the other died within 20 days of the procedure. The thing that I said, as I said, Dr. Tariq, is the combined modalities. And here, I use, for example, laser photo resection with airway stenting, with dilation. They were examined for 14 cases of lung cancer with central airway obstruction, 12 with combined, and two with endothelial disease. All interventional procedures were considered successful in alleviating the central airway obstruction. However, only two of 11 patients who required mechanical ventilation, 18% were liberated, and one patient who was not initially on mechanical ventilation subsequently required uh, ventilation. The authors concluded that although uh, interventional procedures could palliate respiratory symptoms, facilitate, facilitate uh, liberation, and lower health care costs in patients with more advanced uh, cancers, there should be consideration for the early institution of comfort measures. لازم أشوف الحاجات اللي أنا بستريح فيها comfort measures to me and to the patient اللي أنا أستخدمها. وبالتالي يبقى البروكوسكوبي will intervention biology as easy to me as a stethoscope. In a similar study, 14 patients with malignant central airway obstruction, 12 with lung primaries, underwent interventional pulmonology ablative therapies, 100% were liberated men in mechanical ventilation. The patients were 11 patients were extubated within 24 hours, 68.6% subsequently returned home. Rapid liberation was found to reduce ICU cost command. A more recent retrospective cohort analysis examined 36 patients with malignant central airway obstruction referred for severe dyspnea. All patients required intubation or mechanical ventilation. Raised bronchoscopy to be done in 24 hours. 16 patients, 44% had endothelial disease. Two patients had extra luminal compression with a mantosser has mixed lesion. Patient underwent airway dilation or dilatation with laser photoresection and stenting. Interventional uh, pulmonology were 49.4% effective in alleviating dyspnea. Survival was significantly longer in those who received additional therapy versus those who did not. We have articles that are related to individual pulmonology with respiratory failure with mechanical ventilation. We all use the laser and the stent. The vibration of mechanical ventilation is reduced from 50% to 100% from after the interventional pulmonology. Conclusion, the best approach for therapy requires an individual assessment of the tumor causing central airway obstruction with attention to size, location, degree, type of airway involvement. There is no single modality appropriate for all cases. Colicase has modalities with Laser was demonstrated to be effective in elaborating patients from mechanical ventilation when endothelial disease was there. Uh, whereas tracheobronchial stenting was better suited for Treat uh, extrinsic compression. Combined modalities may be necessary in mixed lesions. The effect of central airway obstruction on any given patient's respiratory state uh, status is variable. Additionally, comorbidities like COPD or cardiac neurological dysfunction may contribute to impairment in oxygenation and increased work of breathing. Additionally, factors such as performance and or nutritional status also influence tolerance to sustained breathing efforts. In attempting to liberate these patients from mechanical ventilation, all contributing processes that impair ventilation and oxygenation must be addressed. The relief of central obstruction uh, without concomitant treatment of associated pathology may allow these uh, weakened patients to support their ventilation for only a transient period. وبالتالي لازم بعد كده أكمل التريتمنت بتاعي سواء كيمو راديو كيمو راديو ثيرابي أو 
Complications in interventional pulmonology in patients in mechanically ventilated patients are the same as non-mechanically ventilated patients. It would seem that complications can be divided into immediate and delayed. In immediate procedure related complications occurred in 6.3% only of patients and include hemopsis, pneumothorax, which is rare, infection and death from respiratory failure or hemorrhage. A delayed complications include the granuloma formation, stent migration, disease recurrence, and mucus plugging. The occurrence of immediate complications, although important, this uh, population remains low in comparison to the delayed complications. Generation tissue formation is a delayed response and should occur more commonly in patients with longer uh, survival. لو حصل granulation tissue ده ده ممكن اقلله ازاي بالروتين re-inspection of the airway and early removal of the stents when appropriate when additional therapy the radiotherapy or chemotherapy have succeeded in controlling the local disease and decreasing the size of the tumor. Since migration may be acute or delayed complications for the لازم اتابع العيان re-inspection by fiber optic bronchoscopy again. The experience of the operator plays a role in this as well as the effect of adjuvant therapy may lead to decreased local tumor burden, facilitating stent migration. For these reasons, early bronchoscopic re-inspection of the airways, as I mentioned, should be uh, performed. Uh, mucus plugging also can be uh, both acute or delayed complications, which may be decreased by uh, aggressive pulmonary uh, uh, toilet from the beginning. It is necessary to point out that dedicated interventional pulmonology services are few in many cases unavailable. Uh, the number of interventional pulmonology programs has increased, but still few pulmonologists uh, have training and experience in this discipline. Certainly less complex airway processes may be within the limits of self-retained and experienced pulmonologists. That's why we are uh, insisting to do uh, the workshop for training others. Uh, in summary, interventional pulmonology should be at least considered in every case of central airway obstruction, especially the malignant one, resulting in respiratory failure with interventions pursued in appropriate cases. Both survival and quality of life are improved in most cases. Interventional pulmonology approaches may facilitate implementation of additive therapies, which may play a significant role in prolonging survival. A picture is worth of thousands of words. This is a Chinese proverb. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Ahmad Kurra. And uh, now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, my dear friend and uh, brother, uh, Professor Ahmed Gazar. Uh, Professor Ahmed will speak about foreign body aspiration direction in the tracheobronchial tree, does cardiac magnetic field affect it? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Mr. Chairman, dear colleague, ladies and gentlemen. I am very grateful to my uh, colleague, Professor Tariq Safwat, and all the staff members of the Egyptian Society of Bronchology for inviting me to attend uh, this great conference. <coughs> Uh, this study done by me and my team, uh, my colleague in uh, chest and cardiothoracic surgery in uh, Benha and Kafr Sheikh University Hospitals. Background management of airway for bodies is a challenging for the pulmonologists and otolaryngologists. Despite improvement in medical care and public awareness, approximately 3,000 deaths occur each year from foreign body aspiration, with most deaths occurring before hospitalization. A high index of suspicion is needed for foreign body aspiration to allow prompt treatment and avoidance of complication. Until the late 19th, airway foreign body removal was performed by bronchotomy. The first endoscopic foreign body removal occurred by uh, Gustin Klein in 1897. However, Chevalier Jackson refused endoscopic foreign body removal in the early 19th with technique still followed today. The development of a road lens telescope in 1970, 
and improvement in anesthetic technique have made for body removal much safer procedure. After aspiration of foreign body can settle into a three main anatomical site, either in the larynx, trachea, or the bronchi. Eight to ninety percent of aspirated foreign body become lodged in the bronchi. In adult bronchial foreign bodies tend to be lodged in the right main bronchus as the right main bronchus more in line with the trachea. Several papers have demonstrated equal frequency of right and left bronchial foreign bodies in children. Larger objects tend to become lodged in the larynx or in the trachea. In general, aspiration of foreign bodies <coughs> reduces the following three phases. Initial phase, shocking and the gasping, coughing or airway obstruction at the time of aspiration. A symptomatic phase, subsequent lodging of the object with relaxation of the reflexes that often results in a reduction of cessation or cessation of symptoms lasting hours or weeks. A complication phase, Foreign bodies reducing erosions or obstruction leading to pneumonia, atelectasis, or abscess formation. Clinical presentation depends on the location of the foreign body. A large foreign body lodged in the larynx or the trachea can reduce complete airway obstruction from either the di dimensions of the object or the resulting edema around it. Laryngeal foreign bodies present with airway obstructions and hoarseness or aphonia. Tracheal foreign bodies present similar to the laryngeal foreign bodies, but without hoarseness or aphonia. Tracheal foreign bodies can demonstrate wheezing similar to bronchial asthma. Bronchial foreign bodies typically present those cough, unilateral wheeze, or decreased breath sound, but only 65% of patients present with classic triad. Foreign body aspirations can mimic other respiratory problems, such as bronchial asthma, but foreign body's aspirations differ in the presentation of unilateral wheeze and decreased breath sound. <coughs> the heart is a dynamic organ with electrical activity acting as a rotating bipole, a clump of positive charges separated by affinite distance from an equal clusters of negative charges with a fixed center schematically shown as a battery. It rotates in three dimensions, changing in strength during rotations with the negative pole towards the right shoulder. As, as uh, all of us know that any electrical field any electrical current pass in a wire produce a magnetic field perpendicular to the pathway of the electrical current. <coughs> in 1819, Hans Christian Orsted was the first to show the connection between electricity and magnetism. An electrical current while following produces a magnetic field at a right angle to the direction of the current. Later on, the biomagnetic signals were initially recorded by a magnetocardiogram, the electrocardiogram, the magnetocardiogram, which used induction magnetic coils to detect the fields produced by the human heart. This experiment was recorded by Bull and McPhee. McPhee, this magnetic field found on the chest directly above the heart is most significant in a tangential direction to the chest surface and placed more or less toward the left arm. That reference can be shown in American Heart Journal, 1963. Roth and his colleague succeeded to estimate the cardiac peak magnetic field by using magnetocardiogram, about 14 nanotesla. The highest uh, magnetic machine in any hospitals, usually one Tesla. The magnetic field inside the tissue of the heart and the surrounding lung tissue estimated to be 14, 14 nanotesla. For the cylindrical strands of the heart tissue as a cardiac babillary muscle. This cardiac tissue magnetic field was several times larger outside inside the body larger than outside the surface. On the surface of the body on the left side, 0.05 nanotest. This knowledge stimulated the authors of this paper to study the effect of magnetic field lines in the lung and the direction of foreign bodies aspirated in the tracheobronchial tree. 
الكلام ده اتنشر في جورنال اوف ماثيماتيك بايو ساينس 1988 بيشنت اند ميثودز This work was a prospective study that included 100 patients with metallic and non-metallic foreign bodies who were admitted to the bronchoscopy units of the chest and the cardiothoracic surgical department and the physics department uh, at the Faculty of Science in Bana University, also in the chest department of Kafr Sheikh University Hospital from June 2016 to June 2019. Institutional, uh, institutional ethical committee approved was obtained before initiating this study and the informed consent was obtained from all patients. All patients underwent the following investigation, complete history taking, billing chest uh, radiology, BA and lateral view accordingly, chest computer tomography when needed, uh, complete blood count, bleeding and clotting times, sober conducting quantum interference device, magnetometer, Hitachi Limited Japan MC 6400 system done in physics department faculty of science at Banha University uh, allows a documentation of the feeble magnetic activity produced by the human heart. The distribution of the magnetic field measured over the body surface permits quantifications and the three dimensional spatial localization of the source within the heart. Bronchoscopy either flexible or rigid according to the age and the history of the aspirated foreign body. Bronchoscopy, the bronchoscopist must be familiar with the safest approach for handling a variety of foreign bodies to avoid complete airway occlusion, particularly at the glottic or subglottic levels, migration or fragmentation of objects to more peripheral inaccessible site, and direct airway trauma, for example, lacerations by an aspirated scarf bin. Uh, in anticipations of removing the foreign bodies, the bronchoscopist must be aware of the various accessories, il, il, il accessories available in the suite. As, and regarding, and uh, as, uh, must be aware of the various accessible and the grasping technique and how their use is influenced by the shape of the object, its presenting position and the forceps space available for an instrument insertion. In general, the approach includes the grasping of the presenting part of the foreign body, moving it into the trachea and rotating it so that the greater diameter is in the sagittal plane. By using the rigid bronchoscope as a sheath, the wall of the airways can be protected from injury by pointed objects, specialized grasping forceps, snares, balloon tip, uh, casters, and the magnetic forceps may be essential. And uh, in particular, attention must be paid to the orientations of the foreign body for the largest diameter of the airway. In pediatric patients, rigid bronchoscopy was the procedure of choice for the extractions of aspirated foreign bodies, whereas in adult primarily flexible bronchoscope, especially if the foreign bodies was impacted too distal to access with the rigid bronchoscope. All cases of the tracheobronchial foreign bodies were removed smoothly without complication. As regarding the result, demographic data of the 100 patient, the age ranged from one year to 50 years with the mean age 23.5, six the female was 72 and the male was 28. As regarding the estimation of the magnetic field over the chest wall, there is no magnetic field over the right side of the heart, whereas the magnetic field over the left side of the heart ranged from 0.03 to 0.09 Tesla, nano Tesla, uh, with the mean of 0.07 plus minus 0.02 micro Tesla, but inside the heart, inside the tissue, inside the lung, inside the bronchial tree, it is 14 nano Tesla. As regarding the presenting symptoms of the patient, the history of aspiration was positive in 90%, the dyspnea was positive in 76%, the cough was present in 95%, uh, expectoration in 2%, 2% late complication presented one with pneumonia and one with unresolved lung gaps, localized wheeze in 24 cases. As regarding the set of infections of the foreign bodies in 100 patients, COIN impacted in the upper part of the trachea subglottic region. 
جولدن بروش ان ذا لور بارت اوف ذا تراكيا سوبرا كارينال نون ميتاليك فورم بوديز 67 كيسز ان ذا رايت سايد يبقى النون ميتاليك كل الاورجانيك يوز في سيدز بي نوت دايركتد تو ذا رايت سايد ميتاليك فورم بوديز 30 كيسز دايركتد تو ذا ليفت سايد وان الومنيوم واير ويتش از نون ماجنيتابل ووز دايركتد تو ذا رايت سايد This is a coin in the in one years old child impacted in the subglottic region. This is a golden brooch above the carina. This is a lateral view of the brooch. In the lower part of the carina, above the right main bronchus. Uh, to save time, I cannot believe this is a brooch after its extraction. Sorry. As this is a scarf bin, magnetable, directed to the left side. After its extraction, <coughs> this case presented with lung abscess in the middle loop. This patient treated for two months, uh, and he was the son of the sister of our professor Muhammad Abdul Rahman Musa, with. Treating the patient for two months, cough and expectoration of excessive amount of virulent sputum without response. So he ordered CT scan after this X ray, coronic lung abscess, ordered CT scan. And CT scan shows it coma shaped illuminating object. So he re referred the patient to me for fiber of the bronchoscopy. This is the lung abscess. The after extraction, the wire at the end can uh, uh, lodge between the medial basal segment of the middle loop and the medial segment of the lower loop. Uh, we're piercing it. Uh, this is a whistle of uh, a toy. The dub will be so far. Be out door at the so far. The left one going well. ماجنيتابول فراحت اعطوها على الليفت سايد وقفت طبعا كبيره وقفت في الليفت من برونكس وذ افري اكسبيريشنز يصفر زلاتر الفيو برضه مش عارف ده ده فيرتيبري اوف فيرتيبرا وان فيرتيبرا اوف تشيكن وذ لوجيت ان ذا رايت مين برونكس اند ثانك يو فيري ماتش Thank you, Professor Ahmed Gazar, for your very interesting talk about the foreign body aspiration on the left side, the metallic ones. And uh, Professor Ahmed Gazar, what the ex dean of Banha University. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, so uh, let me uh, introduce the next speaker, Professor Ali Musani. He is uh, from the States, Professor of Pulmonary Sciences and Critical Care. And Professor Ali Musani is the Director of Interventional Pulmonology and Bronchoscopy Service at University of Colorado. Uh, his talk will be on new interventions in COPD and asthma. Professor Ali Musani. Good morning. Um, my name is Ali Musani. I'm a professor of medicine from University of Colorado, and I'll be talking on bronchoscopic lung volume reduction today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be talking to all of you from uh, very far. Um, you are all in Egypt, and I'm in the States. Uh, I'm very thankful to uh, Dr. Huntera and the team for inviting me to uh, speak uh, in this conference. I wish I was there. Um, Egypt is one of my most favorite cities and also my families every time you come there. Um, my family loves to go around Cairo and then take a trip down the River Nile. So we're hoping to do that again very soon. Um, but until then, we will continue to communicate and um, I'll 
can be always happy to share my experience and whatever work we're doing here. Um, along the same lines, I'd like to talk about bronchoscopic lingual reduction today. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. Uh, I work for several industries for um, research and consultation and um, American Association of Bronchology. I served as a president and now I'm a past president. Um, so as you all probably know that emphysema is a um, very common disease. Um, it affects millions of people around the world and approximately 3 million or more in the United States. And uh, majority of emphysema that you see is homogeneous, means it affects both upper and lower lobes, as opposed to heterogeneous emphysema, which only affects uh, predominantly the upper lobes or maybe lower lobes. And then alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which predominantly affects the lower lobes. Um, and treatment of emphysema is very challenging. Pharmaceutical or um, medical management is not always uh, optimal. And over the last several decades, we've always thought about doing some other intervention to help these patients who are in their very advanced stages requiring oxygen and still not able to do any significant exercise. So NET trial or National Emphysema uh, uh, Treatment Trial was part of uh, that effort in which um, uh, lung volume reduction was performed surgically. And what they learned from that uh, was um, that these patients uh, did not always do very well um, um, after the surgery because the remaining lung was usually pretty seriously damaged too. And um, the healing of the uh, suture line or staple line was not always optimal. These patients also had significant comorbidities uh, by the time they developed such a severe emphysema. So uh, what we learned was that in an ideal candidate for uh, lung volume reduction surgery would be a person who has upper low predominant emphysema and has very low exercise tolerance. Second group was the upper lobe predominant emphysema with high exercise tolerance. And then we also learned that the lung volume reduction was not very helpful in people who had non-upper lobe or homogeneous emphysema. Um, it was actually detrimental in them. Um, and to give you an idea of how um, difficult this surgery is, is that it's still to date in 2020, less than 100 or so people get this surgery in the entire United States. Uh, so it's not a very popular surgery. And because of that reason, uh, for the last 15 or so years, we've been trying different modalities to see if we can cause or achieve bronchoscopic lung volume reduction by using different ways of blocking the airways. So the philosophy is still the same, that we go into the affected lobes, but instead of removing them physically, we put different blockers or valves or coils so that the air cannot go into those uh, defected areas to say. And uh, we actually take those affected or uh, non-functional areas of the lungs out of the equation. So all the air goes into the relatively healthier parts of the lung. And as a result, the circulation goes there too. And eventually we have a better BQ matching rather than a significant BQ mismatching because of the air going to non-functional areas of the lungs. Several modalities were tried for heterogeneous emphysema, plugs and blockers. The most uh, sort of a common one was the Watanabe spigots, uh, came from Japan. We all tried it. Sealants and biologics uh, didn't become very popular. Valves, inspiration and emphasis, which is now Zephyr, extremely successful or 
I should say, successful and extremely popular, uh, have been used in Europe and Asia for over a decade now and were approved in the U.S. a couple of years ago. Coils is still uh, not approved in the U.S., but being used in Europe for several years. And for homogeneous emphysema, we had airway bypass procedures. Uh, one of the more common ones was uh, um, airway bypass with exhale stents, which failed uh, and was uh, but never got approval by the FDA. And then there was another one to create additional airways. So all of them had mixed results. The most popular ones are the valves and the coils and valves that are approved in the US. And as I mentioned, the, uh, sorry, the philosophy is that you take out the affected lung from the equation by either physically, surgically removing it or by putting some sort of a valve or um, coil or just pig it so that air does not go into that area and this area eventually collapses and there is a redirection of the volume from this upper lobe to the healthier lower lobe and then the circulation follows and then you have a better mismatch you also remove the physical pressure going from upper lobe to the middle lobe and lower lobe so you allow more space for the middle and lower lobe or the lower lobe to expand and take up larger volume of the lung. Two types of valves uh, that we will discuss uh, today, we'll cover some studies and their applications now in the real life are Zephyr and Aspiration. Zephyr valve is sort of a duckbill valve um, and then the aspiration valve is almost like an umbrella valve. It looks like an upside down umbrella. They come in different sizes. They're both placed bronchoscopically, uh, so no surgery is required. So here is a good example of how bronchoscopically these valves are placed. Um, the area of the lung that we need to block or we want to block is first determined by CT scan and extensive workup including checking for pulmonary hypertension and checking for heart function, uh, full breathing tests. Sometimes we even do perfusion scans uh, and CT scan of the chest, which then does the um, uh, sort of a numeric evaluation of the severity of emphysema and assigns a score to each lobe based on the severity of emphysema. We also look at the integrity of the uh, fissures between the lobes to determine if we will encounter any collateral ventilation, which may uh, at least potentially fail our efforts to collapse that lobe. So uh, once we have determined all that, um, then we sort of decide that, okay, we're gonna block off certain area of the, let's say right upper lobe. So then we go bronchoscopically and perform measurements to the size of those uh, airways leading to the upper lobe. It could be a uh, segmental airway or sometimes subsegmental airway. Um, and then we place valves. So, so it, there is a lot that goes into the preparation prior to this procedure, but eventually, uh, we do this procedure uh, in this fashion. A flexible bronchoscope is put through the trachea into the airway, into the designated lobe uh, in segments in a patient who is under general anesthesia. A valve is loaded into a catheter and put into a um, segment uh, which is predetermined and pre-measured so we know what size of valve we're gonna, or gonna place. And then valve is deployed into the airway. These valves are respiration valves, they're upside down umbrella. So air cannot go in, but air can come out. Secretions can come out. And these are very uh, strong nitronol uh, valves made with silicone membrane. Now for any reason, if we need to remove the valve uh, for any post-operative complications, we can remove them by pulling that pull rod which sort of closes the umbrella, so to speak, and then bring the whole thing out. 
So belts can be placed relatively easily and removed with a little bit more difficulty. And most of the time we are successful removing them if needed. Um, you know, reasons to remove would be persistent post-obstructive pneumonia or pneumothorax is not resolving, which are all very uncommon. Um, Zephyr valve is a dugbill valve, as I mentioned earlier. There have been lots and lots of studies beyond um, uh, rather um, up to the point of approval of these in the U.S. in 2018. Um, both Zephyr and um, aspiration valve underwent numerous studies. Most of those studies were very international, prospective, randomized, uh, often um, shame control bronchoscopies. Um, so this is just some of the, these are just some of the studies that were done for Zephyr wells. Uh, so Ben trial was in 2010, which was published in the England Journal. And then 2015, uh, multiple trials happened again. 2016, impact trial, and then transform in 2017 and Liberate, which was one of the larger trials and was approved and published uh, in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care. And it was, I think, the uh, main uh, large study which led to the approval of these valves in the United States. Before placing the Zephyr valve, as I mentioned, we look at the CT scan to see how the fissures are intact or not, and you have to have 90% fissure intact um, in order to be confident that you will be able to collapse the lobe that you are placing the valves in. Um, so aspiration valve just basically based on the integrity of the fissure based on the CT scan. But this uh, Zephyr valve studies, include, some of the studies include a Chartist system, which is a system which uh, sort of a manually measures the um, collateral ventilation for each lobe. So you inflate this balloon, uh, and block the entire lobe or entire segment, usually lobe, um, because you generally block the entire lobe in bronchoscopic like volume reduction. And then you watch how the airflow slowly decreases because there's no air going in. So th no air should be coming out. And if the airflow continues to stay high after several minutes, then you should start thinking about where is the air coming from. And that's usually from the collateral ventilation from the other lobes because the fissures are not intact. Inspiration valve, as I mentioned earlier, is like an upside down umbrella. There is a removal rod which you can pull and the umbrella will shrink. Um, these are nitronol spurts and then silicone membrane in between. And then these are little sharp edges that bury into the mucosa and anchor the entire valve or, or the granulite structure. So let's go over some of the trials uh, which definitively prove that these valves work. So the REACH trial was a a prospective randomized control trial looking at the efficacy and safety of these valves, the aspiration valves, as I mentioned. Um, again, international, multi center, pretty large study. Uh, 295 patients were screened, 107 were eligible for the study. Uh, 66 got valves, 33 did not, were the shame control or uh, non treatment group. And the primary effect, uh, effectiveness endpoint was uh, the difference between the treatment and control group in the mean FEV1 at three months. Uh, and as you will see in other studies, the primary out outcome was still FEV1, but they were looking at six months and a year. Uh, inclusion criteria were uh, FEV1 should be less than 45, uh, total lung capacity should be more than 100, MMRC scale should be more than two, 
uh, high risk CT should so show a significant emphysema of 40% or more. And there should be a significant heterogeneity of 15%. In some studies, it was 10% between the two lobes, suggesting that it is truly a heterogeneous emphysema rather than a homogeneous emphysema. And an inter intact interlobar fissure of more than 90%. Excuse me. <clears throat> Exclusion criteria was primarily pulmonary hypertension. If somebody has RVSP, which not 45, which almost translates into um, um, significant pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then uh, people who had very significant bullous disease, uh, taking up one third of the lung, people who are still smoking, people who cannot tolerate Bronx or have allergies to uh, um, um, nitronol or silicone or have homogeneous emphysema or had recent exacerbation of COPD. Secondary endpoints were um, um, total lung volume reduction, um, St. George respiratory questionnaire, COPD assessment test, MMRC improvement, six minute walk improvement, and change in RV. These were the secondary endpoint, and as you would remember, primary endpoint for the FEV1. Um, majority of the valves in this study was placed in the lower lobe. Uh, lower lobes, so 23 patients got lower lobes and average was 6.1 valves. So the, as long as it was heterogeneous, we placed valves into lower lobes. And then um, upper lobes, overall upper lobes got more valves than the lower lobes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, valve sizes uh, are basically chosen based on the size of the airway and majority of the valves were uh, placed, large valves were placed size seven, which is seven millimeters, and then six, 36% and 22% for five millimeters. So um, it's most of the time we choose larger valves because then we don't have to put multiple valves. So this, these are the results of this trial, which shows that FEV1 improved 15% uh, is statistically significant in people who did get valves as opposed to controls. And the FEV1 result, impact of uh, increase in FEV1 stayed persistent for six months. So it's almost eight, nine, nine, 10% still after six months. Um, and then six minute walk improved uh, over the six months period. Uh, as you can imagine, as they got better, uh, they developed more stamina, they started walking more, exercising more. And as a result, at three months, they got to their optimal level, which was uh, um, significant, statistically significant uh, change in six minute walk, which is 25 meters. Um, and then similarly, uh, the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire improved. So any decrease more than four point is considered statistically significant. Uh, now their improvement was more than 10. And even after six months, they were close to seven, eight, minus seven, eight SGRQ score as opposed to uh, the controls where SGRQ actually increased the time. Uh, this is an important slide uh, to understand what are the major problems with this uh, procedure or risks. So pneumothorax is a pretty significant complication that happens in these people after this procedure. So one and a half percent had device related and procedure related had uh, some more uh, device and procedure related together. So, you know, in this study, you're looking at a 9% pneumothorax rate, acute exacerbation of COPD is about 7.6% here and 12, so close to 20%. So 
And these are the two major complications. Uh, and um, what we do for them is everybody gets steroids during and few days after the procedure to uh, preemptively uh, treat COPD exacerbation. And for pneumothorax, since we already know, and in some studies, the rates of pneumothoraces were even higher, up to 15, 20, 25%. So since we know that it is a expected complications, we almost don't even consider this as a complication anymore. It's a anticipated problem that we see, uh, anticipated outcome sort of in uh, a large number of patients, anywhere between 10 to 20, 25%. We keep these patients in the hospital for the first three or four days, or sometimes five days. And the reason for that is majority of these pneumothoraces happen in the first three, four days. And I'll show you some slides after the liberate, in the liberate study results that will show that to you. Um, and um, we are prepared, and I'll tell you how we in our center stay prepared for managing pneumothorax in a few minutes. Let's look at a study uh, called Liberated Study of Zephyr valves. So Zephyr valves are the other valves which look like duckbill. Um, this is a multi-center randomized prospective international trial. 24 sites around the world were involved. Again, two to one randomization. And again, the primary outcome was FEV1, but at one year, not three or six months. And secondary endpoints included six minute walk and S. St. George's questionnaire. And if you look at the results here, and the blue are the people who got the valves and yellow are the people who did not get valve. <clears throat> um, so this is FEV1, and this is 15% improvement. So at 45 days, a significant number, a statistically significant number, this had an improvement, which was um, 15%. And then it stayed, 10, stayed at 10 or more percent improvement even after one year in the people who received the valves. Similarly, St. George's questionnaire scores went down 10% or so initially and it stayed at about 8%, uh, sorry, minus 8 score. And as a member, as I mentioned, minus 4 is considered statistically significant. So very significant improvement. Six-minute walk also improved and with time, um, it went up and down, um, but it stayed up at one year. And the RV went down uh, significantly and stayed down after one year. These are some other parameters. Uh, total lung volume reduction happened in 85% of the patients. Um, SGRQ, SGRQ dropped in more than 56% of the patients. So these are the blue and are the valve patients, yellow are the controls. Now again, pneumothorax rate is uh, pretty impressive. 34%, sorry, 34 patients, which is 26.6% of the patients had pneumothoraces and about 8% has COPD exacerbation. So pretty, pretty big number means one in four patients would be expected to have a pneumothorax. Uh, and this is what I was talking about earlier, uh, that most of these pneumothoraces happen in the first three, four days. So if you look at this, 12 and 12, 24 and seven, and then three, 10. So almost 40, 50% of these pneumothoraces, sorry, these are number of events, these are not percentages, but a vast majority of these pneumothoraces happened in the first three days. And then how were they managed? Chest tube or the dark uh, green and uh, valve removal and just chest tubes or the light green or blue. So either they had chest tube placed or chest tube placed and valve removed. A small percentage had nothing, just observation. Um, so, 
This is the reason why we keep our patients in the hospital. So our strategy is we do procedures on Tuesday and discharge patients on Saturday morning. So it's a good four day hospital stay. This is our program. We call it FSM Advanced Therapies or EAT program. It is a multidisciplinary program. Once a month, we meet with lung transplant, CT surgery, COPD, and international pulmonary team. We all sit down in a room, seven to eight, on the first Wednesday of the month, of every month, and we discuss all our potential cases. And we take input from transplant surgeons, from the thoracic surgeons, from lung transplant team, our COPD experts, uh, very uh, well-known COPD experts who've done a lot of basic and clinical research. And we decide which patients are optimal patients for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction versus surgical lung volume reduction versus lung transplantation. Um, and then our uh, we do very protocolized lung volume reduction. As I mentioned, we do extensive workup. We bring them in on Tuesday, do the procedure, admit them in the hospital for four nights until Saturday morning. Every patient gets a thoracic ultrasound on the table before the procedure and right after the procedure, after the, uh, after the procedure on the table to rule out any pneumothorax so we don't wait for the x-ray uh, or um, x-ray to come and take the x-ray and then send us the results. Pneumothorax kit is literally attached to patient's bed or chart the minute patient leaves the operating room and it stays with him till patient is or her till patient is discharged on Saturday. Uh, and the we always admit them in the step-down unit, and the step-down unit has 24-7 doctors, uh, attending residents and fellows present, and they all are pretty uh, experts in putting chest tubes, and we all we have standing instructions for daily x-rays and uh, placement of these uh, sm small bore chest tubes at uh, any evidence of pneumothorax. Um, so very protocolized, standardized approach. We allow patients to move in the room. Second day, third day, we allow them to walk the hallways. And then fourth day, they're almost ready to go home. Um, as I mentioned earlier, everybody gets steroids for preemptive treatment of COPD exacerbation. This is one of our patients who had pretty decent results, so very good results actually, so I thought I would share with you. This was a 66-year-old uh, woman who had 27% FEV1. So these are the requirements. These are the inclusion-exclusion criteria in parentheses. So the requirement is that FEV1 should be less than 45%. She was 27. TLC was 112. TLC was 44. RV was 191. So you can imagine that uh, it was a pretty severe emphysema. Uh, she, could, she could only walk 158 meters in six minutes. And um, she had no significant bullas. She was not a current smoker, had an extensive past smoking history. Um, so we did a CT analysis which showed that the right upper lobe has pretty significant emphysema. The emphysema score is 68. And fissure integrity between the upper and the middle lobe is 99%. Heterogeneity score, AH score from the middle lobe is 34. Or sorry, lower lobe is 34. Comparing to lower lobe, the lower lobe emphysema score is 34. So a big difference of 34 between upper and lower lobe emphysema scores. Fissure is 99% intact. So very intact. As opposed to the left side where the fissure was only 88% intact. So obviously it was, there was a very high risk that there will be a collateral ventilation. Emphysema score was not as high, only 57 as opposed to 68. And lower lobe was 34, so the difference was, uh, so there is a mistake here, it cannot be 34. It's actually heterogeneity score 
sorry, emphysema score was 23, so 23, 57 minus 23 is 34. So difference was pretty the same on both sides, but this was not as severe, sorry, not as severe emphysema as opposed to this emphysema. So as I mentioned earlier, we still do what we call um, Chartist analysis to see collateral ventilation, despite knowing based on CT that the fissure is 99% intact. So this is sort of a report that comes out when you put the CT scan into the system of either Valve um, software that company provides you, or you send it to the company and you get a score and then you can decide based on this, which area would you like to block? So obviously right upper lobe is severe emphysema, severe heterogeneity and intact fissure. So this is a better target. This is not a good target, although the difference in emphysema is pretty high. So severe, good heterogeneity, but emphysema is not very really severe and the fissure is not intact. So there will be a collateral ventilation. So then we go to the procedure and we look for, remember we put a uh, balloon up and look for what we call uh, collateral ventilation. So here's how we do that. So the air is coming out of the lung or the lobes and we are seeing that slowly this air flow is decreasing. And you can see here, this is cumulative and this is for each breath. So cumulative flow of the air is slowly going down, means since there is no air going in, nothing is coming out. And very soon, you will see that it will pretty much come to zero. At that point, we know that there is no collateral ventilation going on, means air is not leaking into that load. So now you can see that there is no air going coming out, which proves that there is no air leaking from other lobes into this lung. So then we go and we measure the size of the airway. Uh, so emphasis valves or Zephyr valve comes in small or large, so we decide what size to place. And then we go in and deploy. So this is our first patient here. We are deploying the valve into that upper lobe. So the valve is deployed and I'll show you in a second how trapped air is still coming out. So this is how the valve deployment looks like. And you can see air coming, see the air coming out, so it opens up. When air tries to go in, when we inhale, it closes. When we exhale, this opens up and the air comes out. So all the trapped air eventually comes out every time you breathe out. But when you take a breath in, the air cannot go in. So eventually this lung or this lobe will collapse. So this was her x-ray before the procedure. You can see her diaphragms are very flat. Lung volumes are very high. Um, as soon as you place the valve, immediately within hours, you can see her diaphragm comes up. And you can start to see her right upper lobe is slowly collapsing. Day five before discharge on Saturday, you can see the right upper lobe has completely collapsed. And the diaphragm has come up. And now compare this lung volume to this lung volume. Or compare this lung volume to the left side. And it tells you that the valve placements were extremely successful. She collapsed her upper lobe, no pneumothorax happened, and um, she got almost as good a result as you would get on a surgical right upper lobe reduction. And a month later, this is her x-ray, it's still diaphragm is up, right upper lobe is down, and I just 
looked at our x-ray almost after a year and it looks just as good as the one after a month. Our PFTs before lung volume reduction compared to one month after. FEV1 increased from 27% to 47%, so a 20% increase. Remember, the study requirement was 15%. Total lung capacity didn't change much. DLCO changed from 44 to 57. RV improved from 190 to 159. RVTLC improved, and the six-minute walk changed from 158 to 240, so very significant improvement and six minute walk as well. So um, I hope I was able to get you some uh, um, introduction to the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I know this is being recorded, so you will not be able to ask any questions, um, but I'm more than happy to give you any responses via email. Uh, Dr. Antera and the team have my email. And I hope that next year I'll see you in Egypt. Uh, we can't wait. We used to come there every year, and now it's been two years. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and enjoy the meeting. And be safe, and, uh, and say hi to my beautiful favorite city and favorite country in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mussini, and we hope uh, to see you again in, uh, in Egypt and uh, as before, uh, two years ago, in our department, the new uh, bronchoscopy suite, uh, inshallah. Uh, now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Semra Pilasaroglu, uh, Professor of Pulmonology, Health Science University, uh, Dr. Sotsin Training and Research Hospital for Thoracic uh, Medicine and Surgery in Azmir. Uh, Professor Semra will be uh, ex uh, chair chairman of uh, Wapib Society. Uh, she will uh, talk about uh, temperance and uh, forefronts in interventional pulmonology. Dear friends, first of all, I would like to thank the Egyptian Scientific Society uh, for Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology uh, for inviting me for the uh, several, I don't know how many times, and this year I'm also invited. It's a pleasure and honor for me. My topic is when temperance and forbearance are virtues in interventional bronchoscopy. <laughs> First of all, let me define what temperance and forbearance are. Temperance in general is habitual moderation and forbearance is avoidance. Good clinical practice is very much correlated with temperance and forbearance in medicine and in interventional pulmonology. What is good clinical practice? It is international ethical and scientific quality standards and mainly it includes ethics and quality in medicine. In the core of good clinical practice, we have patient safety and quality of patient care and all the other factors here relating to patients, communication and interpersonal skills, collaboration and teamwork, management, including self-management, scholarship, professionalism, and clinical skills support this naval discord, which is patient safety and quality of patient care. What does temperance and forbearance in interventional bronchoscopy include? It includes, or they include, balancing ambition and wisdom. And the main goal is the good of patients, which is common with good clinical practice. It includes ambition to improve techniques and innovate, and considering strengths, weaknesses, needs, costs, pre-procedure and post-procedure. I want to mention about patient-centered practical approach because patient-centered practical approach is a tailorized approach to each particular patient in interventional pulmonology, and it is very well correlated with good clinical practice and also 
chaperones and forbearance in interventional bronchoscopy or interventional pulmonology. The main components of patient-centered practical approach are initial evaluation, procedural strategies and planning, which includes indications, contraindications, and expected results, operator and team experience and expertise, risk benefits analysis, and therapeutic alternatives, and also respect for persons, which is informed consent and ethics issues. In the third place, patient-centered practical approach includes procedural techniques and results and long-term management plan. All these four components are important also in good clinical practice. Situational awareness. It is very well correlated with temperance and forbearance and good clinical practice. And what is situational awareness? It is a perception within a volume of time and space. And why is it so important? Because having situational awareness pre, per, and post procedures prevents disasters in high risk environments and during crisis. We have to also have high, um, we have to know the high complication risks in interventional bronchoscopy and interventional criminology. Knowing them beforehand makes us be ready for these complications. Uh, these complications or the risks may be due to the patient or due to the procedures. I won't go over this list, but we have to know the high complication risk situations. Also, we should know that there can be some complications, there can be some complications occurring during or after the procedures and we should be ready for them and we should know which procedures cause which type of complication, the severity in the particular patient that can have more complications. We should know all these details before trying to do a procedure. So there should be a personalized interventional pulmonology management this should be the most ideal management regarding patient, hospital, team, experience, equipment, and budget. And after all these factors are met, we should assess the patient well. And when after doing a detailed risk potential benefit analysis, maybe the most dysnaic and risky patient may be the most benefiting one from these interventional procedures. So I'm not trying to say avoid many procedures in interventional pulmonology, but I'm trying to say that choose the right patient, right procedure with the right amount. And even if there are complications expected at the end of the procedure, if the patient will benefit and benefit weighs heavier than the risks, we should do the procedure. Anatomy is important in interventional pulmonology, and the changes in the anatomy of the patient uh, is also important. Airway anatomy, airway vessel, airway organ relations, because we can have uh, complications uh, regarding these relationships uh, when we do the procedures. Esophagus is just in the is uh, adjacent to the posterior wall of trachea and airway uh, and has a weak wall. We have to know this regarding the complications. Major vessel relationships, aorta, superior vena cava, azigo stain, and pulmonary arteries. They're just very close to airways. And anatomical changes by surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Uh, we should know them before doing the procedures to uh, prevent complications. Uh, due to these changes. Another important issue in temperance and forbearance in interventional pulmonology is cost effectiveness. What is it? It is potential benefit at some cost. So I'm trying to say, if the patient will benefit from the procedure very well, and the cost is high, go and do the procedure. But if the patient is benefiting from the procedure not at all or very little, but the cost is very high and then you should avoid that procedure. So there should be a good decision 
criteria uh, regarding cost effectiveness. Informed consent is not just a piece of paper with some questions asked uh, to the uh, patient, but it can act as a filtering system for temperance and forbearance in the procedures. Because while asking the questions, we may decide not to do the procedure, maybe postpone the procedure, or maybe have some moderate approach in the procedure. Uh, on the day of the procedure or just one day before when we are getting the informed consent. Checklist, what we do before the IP procedures can also be a filtering system for again temperance and forbearance uh, as the informed consent is. Uh, so getting the, uh, doing the checklist maybe one day before on the day of the procedure while checking these different items we may decide to avoid delay or again take a moderate approach in the procedures. So it is a good way of filtering uh, and deciding to do or not to do the procedure. Let's mention about different interventional procedures and give some examples uh, about forbearance and temperance in the procedures. IBAS DBNA, nowadays in the whole world, Many doctors, many hospitals are uh, uh, performing this procedure in large amounts. But how many of them, the ibas dna procedures, are really indicated? Or uh, are they really beneficial to the patient? Okay, maybe technically they are successful, but clinically, what is the importance? Is the patient benefiting as a uh, in the management or in the treatment, uh, it should be debated, it should be discussed. Here is an example. This is an 87 year old woman with congestive heart failure and hepatosplenomegaly with unknown etiology. And she has mediastinal lymphadenopathy in the subcranial and right paratracheal area. And looking at the pet appearances, should we perform EBUS DBNA? or should we follow up this patient? From my viewpoint, following up this patient is a uh, better clinical practice than doing uh, ibas -TBN. Why? Maybe some people will not think like me, but this patient has is 87 year old, has congestive heart failure, some degree of respiratory insufficiency, and uh, hepatosplenomegaly, the etiology unknown. Uh, this mediastinal lymphadenopathy can be reactive due to the diseases, the congestive heart failure or hepatosplenomegaly. Of course, it can be malignant, but if we do the ibas tbna and diagnose the patient with malignant disease, whether lung cancer or other malignancy metastasizing to thoracic lymph node, will we operate the patient? Will we have chemotherapy for the patient? or will she have radiotherapy? None of these will be done. So, I mean, when we are deciding to do a procedure, we should always think about the management and how much the patient will benefit from this procedure. Regarding interventional diagnostic and therapeutic bronchoscopy in pulmonary nodules, periphery nodules, uh, two important parameters come in front of us. One is the the suspicion of malignancy, and the other is the risk of the procedure done to diagnose this peripheral module. So we should always consider these two when deciding uh, to do these procedures. Of course, some critical patients can have diagnostic procedures and maybe uh, therapeutic procedures, but before deciding, we should always have uh, a discussion whether not to do it, follow up the patient, have some palliative practice, or maybe delay at a, to a later time, uh, or have a moderate approach. So the decision should not be made immediately. Uh, everything should be assessed. Here is an example, an uh, example case. A 68-year-old man with pulmonary tuberculosis in 1980 81 but he had anti-TB treatment and uh, recovered. 
but unfortunately, he has pulmonary mycobacterium abscesses infection since 2018, and still uh, the culture uh, in culture this uh, mycobacterium abscesses goes. He has COPD, chronic respiratory failure, and in his chest CT scan in the left lower lobe, there is a 1.5 centimeters speculated nodule, which is suspicious, suspected of malignancy, maybe lung cancer. But it can be very well due to the sequela um, uh, from the past tuberculosis or pulmonary mycobacterium abscesses infection. Anyway, since he has smoked for years, it can be malignancy. So what is the decision? Should we do diagnostic? and therapeutic bronchoscopy for this speculated module, transthoracic needle aspiration or transthoracic treatment such as radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, uh, or radiotherapy, stereotoxic radiotherapy. Again, in this case, I think avoiding uh, therapeutic or diagnostic bronchoscopy is the best choice and to follow up the patient because it can be benign and we can do useless procedures for this module, or it can be malignant, but at this moment, the patient is not symptomatic because of this module. And he has so many comorbidities. Proceed, uh, doing these procedures may cause complications. And because of uh, not having a lot of alternatives as treatment for this module, Maybe only stereotoxic radiotherapy nowadays can be done for this module if it's malignant. I think following up this patient and uh, seeing how it, whether it grows or not, uh, we can decide on the treatment or diagnosis. In interventional pulmonology, therapeutic, in therapeutic bronchoscopy, airway obstruction is one of the main uh, issues. We have to have symptoms, mainly dyspnea, due to airway obstruction. If dyspnea is not due to airway obstruction, but other cause, what is the use of opening that central airway to, bring, uh, to decrease dyspnea? Because it won't decrease. And also, we have to have a sufficient length of life expectancy. If the patient is dying and has one or two months life, why should we go and do the procedure? Visible anatomic borders of obstructive lesion and functional airway and lung parenchyma distal to obstruction are important factors. If we do not have these factors present, why should we open the airway? I mean, technically we can open, but the patient won't benefit from the ablative treatment or uh, stenting that airway. We have to have visible anatomic borders and a functional airway and lung parenchyma is due to the obstructive area. Here is an example. This patient has a, a malignant mass that compresses the left main bronchus, causes obstruction here, but it, it's not the only thing. It is invading the mediastinum widely. It is invading the left atrium and pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. Of course, the patient is dismayed. We may try to do stenting, or maybe if it's endobronchial, we can do some ablative treatment and then stent. But the patient won't benefit from the interventional therapeutic procedure. Why? Because uh, the dyspnea is not just due to the central airway obstruction. It is also due to the cardiac invasion and pulmonary artery invasion, which causes perfusion defect. So in this patient, there is no benefit from ablative treatment and stenting. Maybe other treatments like radiotherapy, maybe chemotherapy, depending on the type of the cancer, uh, malignancy, uh, another treatment can be chosen. But interventional treatment in that patient won't do much benefit to the patient. Here is another example, a 45-year-old man with right pulmonary mass, obstructing right, right main bronchus as here. Uh, but it is not just uh, obstructing the right main bronchus, it is also invading mediastinum uh, widely. Uh, there is extensive mediastinum invasion and also multiple hepatic, cerebral, and cerebellar metastases as seen here. 
uh, cerebellar and cerebral metastases all over, and there is there are many hepatic metastases. And his ECOG status is like three. Should we do diagnostic and therapeutic bronchoscopy in this patient? Open this central airway. Again, this patient is not a good choice for interventional bronchoscopic treatment. Uh, maybe doing only cranial radiotherapy and thoracic radiotherapy, palliative thoracic radiotherapy can be helpful. Uh, otherwise, his dyspnea will not be uh, benefiting from opening this right main bronchus. Uh, and there can be complications also occurring because he, he is not very fit for interventional procedures. And an important issue in uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy is curative treatments for early stage lung cancer. We do not see these cases very frequently, but they are the cases with carcinoma in situ, microinvasive cancer. They're just small, one centimeter squared, less than three millimeter uh, lesions. We should do very well and accurate staging before these curative treatments. Otherwise, they won't be curated. It will be just for our own uh, satisfaction, but if uh, we di diagnose a carcinoma in situ on one side of the lung, but if we do not stage the patient very well with different uh, modalities, uh, there can be other uh, poci of tumor in the other lung or in the other organs, and then it won't be early stage lung cancer, and doing that interventional procedure uh, won't be useful. There should be temperance in sedation and anesthesia during therapeutic bronchoscopy or diagnostic bronchoscopy. We should avoid insufficient and excessive sedation and always titrate the drug and give the sedation dose according to the patient, particular patient, thinking about the comorbidities, age, and other factors. When there is central airway obstruction, the main question should be, is it life-threatening? If it's life-threatening, we should avoid flexible bronchoscopy and use rigid bronchoscopy and do the procedures if they're indicated. But here also the important uh, factors are whether the patient is symptomatic due to the airway obstruction or whether the airway obstruction, the central airway obstruction, is more than 50% of the lumen. If these two uh, answers are no, the patient is not symptomatic due to the airway obstruction and airway lumen is not obstructed more than or 50% of the lumen, then we can choose other treatments like radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and avoid therapeutic endoscopy. Placing a stent following every terminal ablation procedure can be helpful in some cases, but it should not be a routine. Ablate, then put a stamp within you. This is not a, a proper way of approaching. Sometimes the less can be more. Just having ablative procedure and then proceeding to chemotherapy and radiotherapy can increase the survival. Uh, and this type of multimodality treatment is, is studied in the study by Han and colleagues. And they, of course, use stenting as there's some ablative treatments, but not in all cases. Some cases went to chemotherapy or radiotherapy after the ablative treatment. And in that way, by choosing the right patient uh, for stenting or other treatments, uh, they could increase the survival. Dual stenting in malignant tracheoesophageal fistula uh, can be detrimental in some cases. In these tracheoesophageal fistulas, try to avoid uh, self expanding metallic stents in both areas, in esophagus and central airways. We should at least use uh, silicone stent in esophagus and self expanding metallic stent in central airways. And the best is use silicone and silicone in both. Uh, areas in esophagus and central airways. Performing thermal ablation with uh, FiO2, more than 40%, can go 
burns in the airways and in the instruments as seen here. So avoid FiO2 more than 40% when performing hot treatments in interventional procedures. Uh, length of lesion, lung collapse time more than four weeks. Distance of the uh, fiber tip to lesion, flexible bronchoscopic tip to fiber tip. Uh, they should be always uh, assessed carefully and should not exceed the limits. The same is true for the power we use for hot, hot treatment. It should be less than 40 watts. Pass duration, number of pulses, and laser team, they should all have uh, proper numbers uh, and measurements. Uh, I won't go to details, but we should know what we are doing and to which patient, to which lesion, uh, and how much we are doing. Uh, we should be always moderate or uh, in the right uh, levels. Otherwise, if we exceed the limits, we can cause complications. In the right upper lobe anterior segment, doing brachytherapy uh, for a lesion, a malignant lesion, can cause exsanguination in 30% of the cases. Uh, it should be avoided, so there should be forbearance in this procedure. What are the recommendations? Be modest in performing interventional uh, procedures in bronchoscopy, uh, interventional pulmonology. If possible, combine the methods, such as here, have a hot treatment uh, and then uh, clean the, the debris with mechanical cleaning, such as using a, a forceps or the tip of the rigid bronchoscope, bevel of the rigid bronchoscope. Uh, combining methods increases the effect and decreases the complications. We should avoid charring using high uh, power in hot treatments here. This is not recommended. Uh, burning the mucosa, charring the mucosa. And close follow-up, uh, checking the patient at certain intervals uh, periodically is important. So what should we do to have good forbearance and temperance uh, for uh, proper clinical practice in interventional pulmonology? I think reflective practice should be used. What is it? It is open, honest reflection on challenging clinical encounters. The team do all together, they do a procedure, interventional procedure, uh, after the procedure, they come together, all, all, of, all of them come to, together and have the analysis of the experience, what they have done, what did they do as good, what were the weaknesses, what were the mistakes, without naming any member of the team. And then they have conclusions from this experience. And with these conclusions, they proceed to the other uh, procedure planning uh, how to do it better, uh, how could they be uh, doing better procedures for the benefit of the patient with less complications, with less mistakes. So this type of approach is good for the whole team to have uh, a good clinical practice. Of course, education and training is important in interventional pulmonology as in all the areas of medicine. It starts from the training years, uh, goes to interventional pulmonology fellowship, then knowledge accumulates, procedural skills develop, and then at the end we have professionalism and competence, and it should go lifelong. And this type of approach will give us better clinical practice, uh, patient-centered practical approach, and uh, temperance and forbearance approach in procedures. We should validate the outcomes after the interventional procedures at certain intervals. And we should not only validate technical success because it's not enough. We should validate clinical and statistical importance, which is good clinical practice and the benefit of patient. Uh, and this should be done after every procedure so that we know what we are doing, uh, 
how should we improve ourselves uh, is the question. And my last slide, I will conclude with the words of my friend, Professor Atul Mehta. For all interventional pulmonary diagnostic and therapeutic procedures, because it could be done, it doesn't mean it should be done. No procedure should be performed just to maintain skills. A good interventional pulmonologist is the one who knows when not to perform procedure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Semra. This is Imad Kora with you. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, nice lecture. I really uh, uh, was interested in it. Uh, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Simra, the, the most important thing in uh, temperance and forbearance is the presence of a teamwork. Is a team for, to negotiate the cases together. Uh, because you got this feeling when you hold a rigid bronchoscopy and you go inside the patient, you got this feeling inside the patient to remove the tumor, for example, by any mean. Uh, fortunately, I got uh, my team, uh, Dr. Ashraf Matkur, who always advised me to stop aggressiveness with the, within the procedure while doing the bronchoscopy. Uh, I think this is important, and the most important thing also is the, the bronchoscopy is to hear to other opinions. Uh, that's, that's why... Uh, 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 I, 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 I think this is the very important thing uh, to, to stop the, uh, the, the aggressive uh, thinking of doing things to the patient. What do you think? Yes, I agree. And that's why after so many years of bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonary procedures, I decided to give such a talk. In the whole world, it's kind of a... a I do not want to say, but it became like a fashion to do procedures. Some of them are really not so much indicated if we think in detail. So I believe we should consider and discuss the cases very well beforehand. And um, we should do some procedures, even if they are risky, but some procedures can be avoided, as I showed some examples. Uh, we can discuss. I mean, there may be some um, uh, different opinions about that, but uh, cost effectiveness is also important. In my country, interventional pulmonary procedures are like everyone wants to do something. Okay, but as uh, you mentioned, I think Dr. Gazar mentioned, uh, no, who mentioned about it? Tarek Safat mentioned about it, choosing uh, cost-effective lung volume reduction techniques. For example, yes, Dr. Musani mentioned about all those expensive lung volume reduction techniques. They are used in my country too, but after two or three years, the improvement is done and the patient returns back to the first levels. So, could we use more cost-effective material to do some interventional procedures, such as in lung volume reduction? And the cost-effectiveness is not only item. Other things I mentioned are important. So I think temperance and forbearance are important. Not avoid everything, but decide very well, choose the right patient. And if the patient is not fit for that, just avoid it and give other treatments. That's my opinion. Maybe there are different opinions we can discuss. <laughs> right, right, I agree with you. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Semra, for your nice talk. I uh, hope seeing thank you next time uh, face to face uh, and we get rid of this COVID. Thank you so much again. Thank and you. Uh, next session.